But switching gears a little bit, when, when we were preparing for this chat, we were out on your beautiful balcony here, you spoke at length about being a Mason and the occult. Tell us about your beliefs in that. Tell us what that means to you. My spiritual beliefs? Well, that whole circle of sure. information there, because our previous discussion was simply fascinating. So, I was born an Episcopalian, and I was a kid, and you know, I went to my Sunday school and, and followed all of that. But when my mom died, I remember that the the, uh, the priest told me things like. You know, God takes the best first, and uh, didn't make sense to me. And, and your mom, it's going to be like a blink of an eye to her. She's not going to miss you at all, which I misinterpreted totally. So I'm, I'm already questioning things. And my dad now, several years later, is marrying a Roman Catholic. And I'm a teenager who's already thinking in, in terms of, uh, you know, my imprint on the world. And they put me through a, uh, catechism classes. It was just a priest and I sitting alone. And uh, they did just some weird things. One thing is they rebaptized me. I don't know if you know it, but Episcopalians, Lutherans, and Roman Catholics all have the exact same creed. So if you go into the service for either, any of those three churches, it's really the same service. It just seems like the, the Catholics have a lot of statues and fancy robes and things. The Episcopalians quadruple that. They have <laughs> tons and tons of ritual. The Lutherans have no ritual, but the service is about the same. The, the creed is about the same. So I asked them, in, in, our, in our creed, don't we say we believe in one baptism? And, and this priest tells me, well, we're going to rebaptize you in case the first one didn't take. And I'm thinking, it, the first one didn't take, is it like photography? Are there these people that think they've got a good baptism, but it didn't take, and they really aren't baptized? So it just, things didn't make sense to me. And then in college, we were praying for victory in Vietnam at a time when I thought we should be praying for peace. Yeah. And I didn't understand why God would love Americans better or more than he was loving these Vietnamese people. Um, so I, I, I fell away from the church. I lost faith. Um, and it wasn't until years later when uh, David Grooms, who was a member of the Renswell family, um, sat with me night after night. We would sit in the family library four or five in the morning, and he basically showed me all of the world's religions. And um, as we looked at them and, and discovered what they believed, I, I started seeing this pattern and this belief system. And eventually, David um, introduced me to what he had been introduced by Chuck, which was the ability to, to do your own services. So when, when you look at what the Catholic Church is doing, they believe that you can watch this and you can participate with us, but basically our priests have this power and, and you don't. You have to come to us with your intentions and we will do these rituals and these ceremonies. And, and in much of the occult, at least Western occult, so uh, Crowley forward, the, the belief is that you can do it yourself, that you can create your own rituals or use rituals that have been handed down and, and you can do what they do at church. If you're exposed to Eastern philosophy, so Asia, um, they also, they don't go into their temples, they, they watch from the outside, but they have integrated the spirituality and they might stop 10 times a day at a little shrine and do a prayer and, and when you go to somebody's house, you start by going to their shrine at their house and, and praying and, and uh, saying hello to the dead ancestors and the not yet born ancestors. So if you if you look at all of that that I had been exposed to from David Grooms, and you look at the occult services that he and Chuck were doing, I naturally kind of fell into that and started doing it myself. 
And, and for those of you who hear that and say, oh, that's black magic and that's some type of paganistic religion and um, it's not black magic. I, I know, I mean, we owned it in a cult bookstore. A cult just means hidden. It just means you, you aren't usually shown this. So it's the things that the priest does on the altar. You don't know how to do those things because it's been hidden from you. So there is no praying to the devil. There is no trying to get your enemies. Um, not that I suppose somebody couldn't do that, but they could do that in the Catholic Church. They could go in there and wish for somebody to be killed or um, pray for, for bad intentions. But of all the people that I met, I never saw anyone that was practicing anything dark like that. People were asking for the same intentions that you do when you go to church. They were asking for health or success in something or love, or peace. So through my exposure within the, the Renzel family, I was exposed to this. I came to adopt it for my own. Um, not that we didn't go to churches also, um, you know, we have, I mentioned my children earlier, we have two children. Um, they were both baptized um, in the Episcopal Church. One later was rebaptized by the Roman Catholics. Gotta love the Catholics. Um, I consider myself an Episcopalian. I was, uh, you know, raised there and I was confirmed in the Catholic Church, so I consider myself a Catholic. I don't know that they consider me a member of the faith because I don't, you know, some, especially since Chuck's passed, we used to go to Easter and Christmas services, but the bare minimum requirements I don't do. Um, and I'm sure that, that they would not approve of, of my occult beliefs, but I, I consider myself, you know, a Christian among other things. And uh, it's all good. I, I'll take it where you haven't taken me yet, but I know that, that we're leading up to that, and, and you may have mentioned it, and that's my Masonic affiliations. So along the way, I've, I've rediscovered God. I have a very strong belief, again, in God. Um, and I'm performing services, or I'm, I'm participating with other people in, in services. I, I saw myself as a spiritual tourist, so when I traveled Japan, Thailand, Ireland, South America, the things that I wanted to do was explore their religious and spiritual places. So I've done that all over the world. I've done that here. I've gone to every type of church service and, uh, you know, temple and, and mosque that you could go to. So none of them were mine. I was a tourist in them, and uh, then we discovered masonry. Um, we can trace its history most definitely to the 1700s, but by mentions of us in uh, other documents, poems and things, we can trace it to about 900 in, in England. And we know from that poem, which is something called the Regis poem, they were talking about it coming to England a lot earlier. Some people believe that it can be traced all the way back to the ancient sun worshipers in, in Egypt. But it is a spiritual fraternity. It is not a religion. Um, and, and what they practice, rather than a mass, is a Western magic ritual. And the ritual that they do in their temples and in their lodges is identical to the rituals that we were doing at home in our occult services, and it's just that the intention that they have behind it, the work that they were doing or are doing, is to make a man into a mason. So they are initiating him over a series of three rituals and giving him this information. So masonry is based on the allegories um, from the stonemasons guild. So the tools um, that they give you are these ancient stone masons, uh, squares and compasses and setting mallets and uh, plumb lines. And then they teach you how to use those 
in a uh, spiritual way to finish what we believe is an unfinished temple that exists inside of all people. It's okay. where you go to meet God. It's where God resides in you. It is that one point of view that is God. Kind of a sideline. I believe that if you have God here as this all-encompassing everything, as you move down towards man at 6 o'clock, we start seeing ourselves as less a part of this. We start thinking of ourselves as individual fingers. But if we go back up that circle, we find out that, oh, we're a hand. And if you step back even further, we say, oh, we're a whole body. Till you eventually get back to where you are that one thing that encompasses the entire universe. And not to bring it back to the dawning of the age of Aquarius, but <laughs> with, with knowledge and with the awakening and re-understanding of where we've come from, you start the path back. Um, for Masons, we, we believe that we met God in the East, and we are now traveling back to the West to seek what has been lost. Discovering masonry for myself and for every member of the, of the Renzel family that, that eventually became active in masonry was a acknowledgement of our personal beliefs and our personal journeys. It was a, uh, it lended credibility. It gave us a structure whereby we could go in and acknowledge with other people who are on their own journeys. And, and so, you know, if you went into my lodge tonight, which is Hysteria Lodge, um, number 411 in Chicago, Illinois, uh, a lodge of the Grand Lodge of Illinois, um, you would find four holy books on our altar representing the four major religions of the people who are members of, of my particular lodge. Um, and all of those people, some who are very devout Christians and some who are uh, Muslims, um, we, we have a Buddhist. At one point we had a uh, Native American, we, we were going to put a bundle of sage on the altar to represent a holy book for him since they didn't have one. But regardless of the journey that each of those members is on, when we get together, and perform this one ritual to make another man a mason. It unites us. Um, you know, we don't talk religion in Lodge. We don't talk politics in Lodge. We don't talk about anything that brings people apart. We tend to, to concentrate on the things that bring people together. So I've continued. I served in our Lodge as the secretary for, I think, 17 years. But, um, I am now in my 10th year on the board of directors for our statewide charity. So one of the things Masons do, you have this old stone Masons guild um, from the mid centuries, and they have this knowledge. And the knowledge basically was geometry. It was how do I build a structure that's not going to fall down in a stiff wind. Um, that's incredible knowledge. It, it, gives you a reason to go to other countries at a time when people didn't do that. You know, you were born on the land of some nobleman, lived your whole life out here. You weren't free to travel. The Freemasons were. That's why we say free. They were allowed to travel because each of the different leaders, potentates, kings, they wanted to, the Masons to come in and build their structures, so they allowed their Masons to travel and they just kind of trusted the Masons to be able to move about, um, which, by the way, put us in uh, association with a lot of different belief systems around the world, which gave us our ability to incorporate and find some truth in all men's religions. Um, surprisingly, at a time when we were building structures for individual religious beliefs, so we could be working for the, the Roman Catholic church to build a, a, a cathedral. At the same time, some of the people that are working on that were Muslims. Um, so it, it just put us in a very unique place. Now that the knowledge had to be protected, if everyone has that knowledge, then everyone can earn these huge wages and, and travel about the country. So we took an oath to protect the knowledge and to dish it out slowly. Um, that survives today in these three initiations. 
Um, we also took, it was dangerous work, so we took an oath to protect each other's widows and orphans. That exists today, and that is the charity that I chair. Um, we have about $114 million endowment to take care of our members um, and, and their widows and orphans, their families. So we have caseworkers, I have maybe 80 clients in a given month that are on our month-to-month -month program. Now there are 80 who are looking for individual one-time help. We're on disaster relief if a hurricane hits in Texas. We're on the ground. We, we actually are there before because a hurricane gives us warning. Something uh, that we're not expecting, you know, maybe we get there the, the week after. But um, we're doing a lot of good work. I, I can't help but ask this geometric knowledge, the mathematical equations, from where do they derive? How did the Masons come to have that? That's a mystery, isn't it? Yeah. Um, uh, sort of again, you can, you can trace us to about 900, or at least know that we existed. We can prove that we existed in, in the year 900. But where we were before that, it depends on what your belief is and the faith that you have. Um, again, many people, myself included, believe that we came from the builders of the temples and the pyramids. They, they had knowledge to build those. We know they did. They, those structures still exist. Why don't we know how they built it? Well, because it was secret. It wasn't something that they shared with everybody. And how do we know that they have this secret knowledge? Well, because we still don't know how those things got built, and they're still there. Um, you can go around the globe, and you will find evidence of Mason. Our symbols are there. Our symbols are on the cathedrals. Our symbols are all over the city of Washington. Um, you know, here's an, an interesting fact that Washington... D.C. was selected because it was low-lying swamp that none of the states really were using. So it was an easy place to say, well, we're going to carve this out and take it for the federal government because none of the states really wanted it. There were two high hills in that whole area that weren't swampy. One became Capitol Hill, and it's where our government resides. Guess what's on the second one, the National Masonic Monument? Yeah. Well, why is that? Well, because <laughs> Masons built Washington, D.C., Masons built this country. Every one of the principles that the United States is built upon was a Masonic principle before that. So freedom of speech, freedom of education, freedom of association, all of those things for 100 years, hundreds of years, were Masonic. Or if you listen to the oath of office that, more so the vice president than the president, but if you listen to the oath of office and you listen to one of our um, uh, installation rituals, they're identical, or at least a lot of the wording is identical. When Washington was being sworn in, he, he made up his own uh, inauguration because we'd never inaugurated a president before. Well, he pulled from his Masonic experience how do, was I? Um, how was I installed as the worshipful master of my lodge? And he wrote a ceremony very similar to that. And on the way to his inauguration, he stopped off at the lodge and grabbed their Bible so he could be sworn in. And we swear you in on a Bible. He got sworn in on a Bible. That Bible still exists at the lodge in Washington. I've had the privilege of visiting it. And I uh, wasn't allowed to put my hand on it. You know, all of the, the our money is filled with Masonic symbols. You, you'd be surprised. So the conspiracy theorists now say, oh, well, you've got this new world order. You're trying to, like, take over. First of all, it's a very old world order. It's not very new. Um, and secondly, we aren't trying to impose it on anybody, but we are trying to express it and express it in a way that it will affect the world. So all of the leaders of the world's Western revolutions were Masons. The Masons didn't do those things, but 
that the same type of person that would be attracted to masonry is the type of person that would get involved in, in the formation of their country. And the closest that we did, that, that you can say, oh, that was a Masonic Lodge with the Boston Tea Party. You can read in their Lodge minutes how they adjourned their meeting to take care of some business. Went down to the harbor and did that. They came back and started the lodge up again <laughs> and, and recorded it all. Um, I will say this that history is ripe with um, stories from the wars, the, the Civil War, probably most vividly, where battles were stopped so the Masons on one side could exchange bodies with the Masons on the other side because both sides trusted the Masons. You're going to get the bodies back and bring ours back, and you're not going to tell them anything. And you're not going to. I can't say with um, certainty, but I've always been told that at the time that we broke off communications with Cuba in the 60s, John Kennedy had to have some way of communicating with the Cubans, even though we had no formal diplomatic ties. And the way that it has been done, I'm told, ever since was the Grand Lodge of Massachusetts communicates with the Grand Lodge of Havana, who communicates with the Castro's, and, and vice versa. So we've always had, I mean, even if you look at the Knights Templar, the Knights Templar have this, this whole history that people are aware of from the time of their persecution when the King of France, who was also trying to become, uh, take control of the Catholic Church, turned his forces against the, the Templars. The, and the Templars came to the Masons and, and basically hid with the Masons. Um, what, what you wonder, though, is, well, why did he do that? Why was he so concerned with getting them? Well, because they were a huge power. They were a huge army that had no allegiance to any country. And they were the bankers mm -hmm. of the world. And why were they the bankers? Because everyone could trust that if they were going to move this money from this country to that country, they were going to get it there. They were going to be able to do it, and they were going to do it safely, and everyone trusted them on that side and this side. So, you know, Harry, Harry Truman once uh, gave a, a very famous fireside chat where he said, you know what, guys, if you're in the trenches and you're feeling really down and like there's no hope, find yourself a Freemason and, and take it to him. And, and that's kind of, that's the truth. <laughs>